Hello there, welcome to the Mapungubwe Institute for Strategic Reflections, the annual lecture, it's the eighth annual lecture. We're uh, live here from the University of Johannesburg, the Kingsmead campus uh, here in Auckland Park. Thank you so much for joining us. It is uh, going to be a very interesting discussion, a very enlightening discussion, and I think a very engaging one as well. So uh, a very important milestone for Mistra this year as it celebrates 10 years of existence, 10 years of being very much at the center of a discussion on South Africa's uh, a polity and a political economy will also tell you about the main lecture itself, which is going to be delivered by its executive director, Mr. Joel Nechutenje. He'll be discussing the theme, Can South Africa's Civilization of National Democracy Sustain Itself? And of course, Mapungube Institute itself, a very important name with a lot of historical uh, context, if you're talking about one of the greatest kingdoms, inland settlements in Africa, Mapungubu was exactly this. It was a wealth of cultural information, especially when it came to areas of uh, architecture and development. All of this very much tying into uh, the significance of the work that Mapungubu does. Um, and of course, very interesting to note that uh, uh, in this uh, reality that we live in of climate change, that kingdoms such as Mapungube came to cease to exist because of climatic change. But of course, uh, the climatic change itself, a very interesting question. I'm sure it's something that will come up during the lecture. So fitting, as I said, that uh, Mapungube carries this name, the work that Mistra does, that of uh, social equity, uh, nation formation, economic growth discussion, looking at South Africa's global positioning, and uh, we're hosted here by the University of uh, uh, Johannesburg, as I mentioned, its vice chancellor, uh, the principal of UJ, Professor Cherizi Marala. I'll introduce him in just a moment, but I must say, um, my introduction of you, Professor Marala, I, I knew as Professor Big Data, uh, Professor Artificial Intelligence, because that was the first time I actually made connection with not only the existence of digitization, but you gave it a very uh, important spin of centering it on the uh, social and cultural context of uh, South Africa. Uh, so also very fitting that you are the vice chancellor of this particular university. I'm sure many of you know the history of it. It was envisioned as a modern university that would spring from unification and not the separation that was enforced on it. Uh, so um, you'll talk a little bit more about why you are in partnership with uh, Mistra. But uh, without further ado, let me please uh, introduce Professor Jerizi Marala, who is uh, going to welcome us as a host and as a co-partner of this very important initiative. Thank you very much, uh, Tsepiso, uh, Mr. Joel Nechitenje, uh, Dr. Fraser Muleketi, Professor Ndechana, and all the people who are with us today. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to welcome you tonight at the University of Johannesburg. The University of Johannesburg is the largest university in Johannesburg. 52,000 students and now seven campuses. We are the first university in South Africa to complete the academic year. We have completed the 2020 years, uh, uh, academic year despite the many challenges that we face as a globe. For example, we all know that we are living in the middle of a pandemic, a pandemic that, have, that has uh, ravaged the global economy and that is going to be uh, with us, uh, we don't know until when, uh, as a result of our ability to blend physical learning with digital learning, we were probably the most placed university in South Africa and beyond to be able to move completely online. Tonight, we are going to have a, a, a fifth lecture of Mistra. It's the eighth, but it's the fifth to be held here at the University of Johannesburg. And uh, this lecture is going to be delivered by 
Mr. Joel Nechitenje. We all know him, an um, ANC veteran, uh, a man of great uh, intellect, and to really talk about how do we make sense of um, society, politics, economics, uh, given all this pandemic. Uh, I think uh, for us uh, as a nation and as a continent, there is only one way out of this quagmire, and that way is basically scientific thinking. We have to ingrain into our culture, into our practices, into all activities of our lives, the civilization of science. We have to embed it uh, in our decision making uh, because in these great times of great challenges, it is important that uh, as a nation we learn to make decisions rationally. And when I talk about making decisions rationally, I really mean uh, using logic, but also using data. Using data for us to be able to make sense of our environment, using technology to make sense of our environment and data so that we can be able to make quite uh, uh, um, effective decisions. Of course, as a country, we are confronted with even more uh, challenges a fra fragile uh, political uh, uh, situation that uh, if we do not make sense of, it can actually overwhelm us. So it is important that um, we interrogate without fear or favor because it is only through this that we are actually going to uh, succeed. In conclusion, I am reminded uh, of uh, Chief Albert Lutuli who once said, and I quote, I believe that here in South Africa with all our diversities of color and race, we will show the world a new pattern of democracy. There is a challenge for us to set an example for all. Let us not sidestep this task, close quote. Have we failed to live up to this expectation? Are we able to remain a democracy even with the challenges of technologies that are taking away our democracy? We know about the Cambridge Analytica scandal which is alleged to have influenced the US uh, elections. So it is important that as we make sense of all the problems that uh, we are confronting, we tackle uh, these problems with knowledge in its totality, society, economy, politics, and technology. Once again, I welcome you to the University of Johannesburg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cherries. You raised some very important points, especially during uh, this uh, unprecedented time of COVID-19 uh, and just uh, reflecting on the word uh, community, I think COVID-19 has really uh, brought forth the realities of uh, not only the normative constructs of what we think communities are, uh, but uh, how we've had to learn to change that. And of course, technology making it very easier, I think, for us to connect with uh, others, especially at this point of physical distancing, but unfortunately we've been forced to social distance, but technology has uh, made it easy work for us to connect uh, not only uh, regionally throughout the globe, but even with uh, our nearby neighbors whom ordinarily we'll be um, able to see. So this has been a very uh, intriguing time for us to reflect on. Uh, and speaking of this, uh, COVID-19, uh, we've lost a lot of um, family members, we've lost a lot of friends, we've lost a lot of leaders. And I think Misra would also uh, like to thank not only for her work, she'd recently uh, joined uh, Misra, but um, the country as a whole would like to uh, thank Dr. Vuyo Masati, somebody who was not only uh, passionate about agri-economics, she was a gender activist, she was an entrepreneur, and certainly very much at the forefront of uh, 
issues such as uh, the International Women's Forum. She was a global leader there. And uh, in the Eastern Cape and Butterworth, her work is very much known. So let us then take a minute to remember, celebrate, and of course, uh, ensure that we stick by the lessons that she brought us and learned with us, Dr. Vuyo Matlati. All right, so as uh, some would say, the Boabab has uh, fallen, but not really. The Boabab has really deep roots, and this is somebody I can attest to, was very much at the forefront of empowering women, young women, uh, was about strengthening the networks of women, giving women a hand up. Dr. Vuyo Masati, so, if you've just joined us, you are watching the Mapungube annual lecture. It's the eighth one. Mr. Um, has had a series of lectures of uh, very uh, eminent persons who've delivered uh, the lecture. We'll take you through that in just a moment, but I also want to uh, take you through the theme, as I mentioned earlier on, it is going to be delivered by Vojol Neshitenje in just a moment, uh, looking at uh, South Africa's uh, civilization of national democracy. Will it sustain itself? And just before we do that, looking at the previous lectures, just to, to introduce to you later on, we will be joined by a Professor Mkrebisin Zlejana from UJ. And uh, apologies for not being able to honor the invitation from Gogo Obrimajiku, who was also supposed to join us uh, this afternoon. So before we introduce Virgil Nechitenja, let's uh, reflect back on some of the important discussions that Mitra has had.
So as you can see, that, you, that is who our main speaker is going to be. Before I give you the formal CV and uh, give you his credentials, I think a, a little anecdote from the first time I met Joel Nechitenje. It was about, I think, 18 years ago. Yes, so that takes away any notion that I might be 22. But um, I had wanted to labor union history and um, he volunteered I think that's what it was if uh, his arm was twisted I'm not sure but he he readily agreed and I, I must admit I thought it was going to be a 30 minute session but five hours later I was fully grounded on the country history. but what I found very um, intriguing about it was that there were so many facets to it but none of it leaning to uh, one end or the other, very objective uh, overview of the country's historical um, machinations from that sector. So I pretty much believe that's what you're going to get. So without uh, too much talking, let me introduce to you uh, Mr. Joe Nechitenja. As I mentioned, he is the executive director here at uh, Mistra, also vice chairperson board of governors of the Mapungubwe Institute for Strategic Reflection. He has a master's uh, science degree in financial economics and a postgraduate diploma in uh, economic principles from the University of London, as well as a diploma in political science uh, from the Institute for Social Sciences in Moscow. He's a visiting professor at uh, the Witt School of Governance. Before his retirement, he served in government as head of communication for former President Nelson Mandela's office. He was also CEO of GCIS. He was head of, uh, un head of uh, the policy unit in the presidency as well, also a member of the first National Planning Commission. And uh, he is a non-executive director of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and the Life Healthcare Group. He has since been a member of the National Executive Committee of the NC 1991. So uh, quite a mouthful, <coughs> yes, but it gives you the many perspectives from the prism from which he delivers this lecture. So ladies and gentlemen, the Mapungubwe Annual Lecture, the 8th, delivered now by Wojo Nechitenje. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director Tsepiso Makwekla. Chairperson of the Mistress Council of Advisors, Dr. Geraldine Fraser Mulegeti, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg, Professor Chilidzi Marwala, fellow panelists and colleagues who have joined us this afternoon. I wish to thank the Council of Advisors and the Board of Governors of the Mapungubwe Institute for this privilege to present the Mapungubwe Annual Lecture, which is based on two fundamental questions which inspired the very formation of MISTRA. Why do nations succeed and how do civilizations sustain themselves. Two events informed the decision to make these two questions the fulcrum of our reflections this year. The first is that uh, the Mapungubwe Institute celebrates its uh, 10th anniversary in 2020, which in our estimation is a momentous event in its own right. The second one pertains to the global disruption of uh, COVID-19, which in a sense is a prod to the think industry to improve its utility to humanity. I've been asked specifically to reflect on the question can South Africa's civilization of national democracy sustain itself? Understandably, the question that immediately arises is the very meaning of civilization. As we all know, 
This concept has generated much debate over centuries. In the recent period, which is characterized by the end of the Cold War, unique military conflicts and the rise of China, Samuel Huntington argued in an article in 1993, and I quote, Arabs, Chinese, and Westerners are not part of any broader cultural entity. They constitute civilizations. A civilization is thus the highest cultural grouping of people and the broadest level of cultural identity that people have short of that which distinguishes humans from other species. The source of conflict in this era will not be primarily ideological or primarily economic. The clash of civilizations will dominate global politics, he said. It is not the purpose of today's discussion to deal with the reasons that led Huntington down this path of logic. But we are obliged to start off with a conceptual clarification of the notion of civilization. More accomplished scholars than Huntington define a civilization as a complex human society with certain characteristics of cultural and technological development, including social organization, social stratification, established religion, art, architecture, as well as systems of language and writing. The Mapungubwe Institute believes that uh, while helpful, this definitional framework misses critical matters about the evolution of humanity's sense of social justice. In this regard, David Ricardo's assertion some 200 years ago on the distribution of wealth comes to mind. He says that the produce of the earth is divided among classes of the community. And to determine the laws which regulate this distribution is the principal problem in political economy. Beyond this, I think, are matters of gender relations against the background of millennia of patriarchal domination and broadly the manner in which all vulnerable sectors of society are treated. Critically, how the environment is managed should be a fundamental uh, element in defining a civilization. And so Mistra's approach to the notion of civilization has nothing to do with the evangelism of right-wing religiosity, whether it's Christian, Islamic, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, or any other. It has nothing to do with the, the special delineations that excite the imagination of geopolitical warriors, nor the self-indulgent and arrogant sense of superiority that tickle the fences of the apostles of racism. It rejects the glorification of colonialism as some civilizing mission, introduction of new technologies notwithstanding. As distinct from these retrogressive approaches, Mistra believes that discourse on civilizations should draw from a deep humanism, combining three fundamental issues, how we transform natural endowments for the benefit of humanity, how we manage social relations, and what environmental inheritance we bequeath to future generations. 
In this regard, we are inspired by the profound words of two luminaries who were leaders in our struggle for freedom. At the turn of the last century, Pixlika Isaka Seme asserted, and I quote, the regeneration of Africa means that a new ethnic civilization is soon to be added to the world. The most essential departure of the, this new civilization is that it shall be thoroughly spiritual and humanistic. Indeed, a regeneration, moral and eternal. And according to Steve Biko, the great powers of the world may have done wonders in giving the world an industrial and military look, but the great gift still has to come from Africa, giving the world a more humane face. I should warn that our discussion today is not on current affairs, tantalizing as issues at the Zondo Commission or in faraway Malawi may be. Rather, we shall seek to examine whether the words of Nelson Mandela at his inauguration in 1994 can stand the test of time. And he said, the sun shall never set on so glorious a human achievement. Now, let me briefly foreground the discussion on South Africa with a brief description of some of the ancient wonders of human ingenuity. This is how Diop describes the civilizations of the Nile River, including Egypt and Sudan. Pythagorean mathematics, the theory of the four elements of the tiles of Miletus, Epicurean materialism, Platonic idealism, Judaism, Islam, and modern science are rooted in Egyptian cosmogony and science. Taking this further, Seme drew attention to the pyramids of Ethiopia, which though inferior in size to those of Egypt, far surpass them in architectural beauty, their sepulchres, which evince the highest purity of taste. Reflecting on the intellectual pursuits of Timbuktu, Tabo Mbeki opines that this center of intellectual engagement represents very important dimensions of Africa's greatness and its contribution to the history of humanity. It is a world-renowned center of trade and research and scholarship in the fields of science, mathematics, religion. Timbuktu produced and attracted artists, academics, academics, politicians, religious scholars, and poets. The citadel of uh, Machu Picchu, of the Inca in Latin America, existed for about a century and was abandoned around the time, time of the Spanish conquest, though it was never invaded. And after many years of humiliation and experimental missteps, China today is the second largest economy on the globe. And one writer described it as follows. From the 10th to the early 15th century, per capita income in China was higher than levels attested for Europe. It was only between the 15th and 18th centuries that China yielded its economic lead to Europe. 
There followed from 1820 to 1949 a long period of economic decline and humiliations from abroad. So much has been written about the more well-publicized societies of the Roman Empire, Athens and Sparta, as well as the industrial revolutions of Europe, the wonders of Mesopotamia, India's majestic creations of engineering precision, such as the Taj Mahal, and so on. Closer to home, we can talk about Sofala, Kilwa, Mapungubwe, Zimbabwe, and many others which share these unique attributes. Now, the fundamental question, which is very relevant to our discussion today, is why did these achievements dissipate? Only to mock generations which followed like riddles that taunt and intrigue. Firstly, some civilizations collapsed when the polity lost legitimacy, particularly in the eyes of the community, at times as a consequence of misgovernance that went along with hubris, nihilism, and nemesis. Secondly, there are many instances where the depth of stratification in a society and the social distance that was generated could not be sustained by a civilization. Thirdly, some civilizations had a careless attitude towards the environment leading to its rapacious exploitation or to poor preparation for disasters. Fourthly, there were cases of pestilence that led to disorganized collapse of systems of social organization combined with scapegoating, witch hunting, and degenerate selfishness. The fifth element that led some of the civilizations to collapse relates to violent conflict, including what some have come to refer to as the Thucydides trap. That is the decline of a dominant empire as it seeks to block a rising power that it perceives as a threat. Many wars from that between Sparta and Athens to the First and Second World Wars were a consequence of this dynamic of the Thucydides trap. Now, given that humanity has survived these periods of decline, perhaps our species has an inherent capacity for regeneration and self-sustenance. But we dare ask, at what cost to life, with what loss to historical capabilities, and at what expense in terms of assets acquired over generations. But let me add that before we sink into pessimism, at times, after an epidemic, a new and robust body of knowledge and mode of existence can emerge. For example, the bubonic plague, which decimated populations of Europe and Asia and led to the death of half of the residents of Florence in Italy, may have in its wake laid the basis for a renewal of the economy, the polity, and the culture of Italy. But we dare ask again, at what cost? Now let, let us come closer to home and get one conceptual question out of the way. Can we characterize South Africa's national democracy as a civilization? To answer this question, we fall back to the basic law of the land, which guarantees all generations of human rights. 
Now with 26 years of lived experience, this may sound trite, partly because the civilization character of the constitutional dispensation cannot be drawn from a contrast with what existed before. It relates to the philosophical foundation of the new society, to aspiration and to praxis. It entails the freedom of those who were oppressed, but also the liberation of the oppressor. In other words, to quote an assertion that was made a few years ago, South Africa's liberators are required to manage and lead both the oppressed and the oppressors. To turn the provocative, racist, and the sexist prose of Radiad keeping on its head, in South Africa, the white man's burden has both in theory and in actual practice become the black man's In other words, there coexists in South Africa an advanced metropolis and a poverty colony. In this sense, the South African experiment is not so much unique or exceptional but a laboratory of humanity as it seeks to address universal challenges which revolve around race, class, and gender. The efforts to reverse this historical injustice, to create an antithesis of internal colonialism, is South Africa's civilizing of the current age. Program director, for the sake of completeness, let us briefly characterize the global environment in which South Africa's efforts of social change manifest today. We are a small open economy, and many of the country's fund economic fundamentals are influenced as much by developments in other parts of the world as they are by perceptions among global economic actors of the dynamics in our political economy. Like other countries, South Africa today has to navigate the changing global power balances and ensuing geopolitical tensions, especially in relation to China. While change in leadership in the United States may moderate the tone of engagement, most analysts believe that uh, the strategic posture of intense rivalry, the so-called Asia pivot, is bound to continue. The global market system is in poly crisis with multiple challenges, slow economic growth, debilitating identity politics, growing inequality, and so on. The level of strategic acumen amongst the leadership leaves much to be desired. And in the sciences, hyper-specialization, ideological partisanship, and reliance on standard fare constrict spaces for creative transdisciplinary thought. It would seem that some leaders of global corporations have keenly sensed this danger, and to quote one of them, the Rothschild, faith in market institutions has rarely been lower. Markets mostly encourage a near maniacal focus on short-term financial results. Tolerance of disparities of opportunity and an apparent disregard for the common good. If these tendencies are left unchecked, she concludes, the public cannot be expected to show faith in capitalism. These difficulties have been worsened by COVID-19 
And this would include the crippling debt, which is facing many de de developing countries. And the fact that, according to Oxfam, 32 of the world's companies stand to see their profits jump by 109 billion US dollars more in 2020. And the fact that the reversal in reducing poverty will be delayed by at least three years. That's as a result of COVID-19. One of the deficits is the allocation of research resources and poor attention to long-term foresight studies. In this context, many have challenged the characterization of COVID-19 as an extreme, extremely rare black swan event. Rather, they argue that it is a gray rhino event, a highly probable, high impact, yet neglected threat, as gray rhinos are random surprises, but occur after a series of warnings and visible evidence. Now, all this critique may sound too harsh, but it is well deserved, because today, the current civilization seems to be rising to the occasion, at least at the level of vaccines. This is through transdisciplinary undertakings, not just medical science, which includes nanotechnology, microbiology, genetics, artificial intelligence, and even engineering. The RNA-based vaccines hold much promise as a new drug class that may stand humanity in good stead even beyond coronavirus. What about South Africa's uh, trajectory going forward? Now, to recapitulate, South Africa combines the attributes of both an erstwhile metropolis and a colony. The attainment of the ultimate constitutional objective should result in the emergence of a new and unique civilization. The changes, particularly at the level of the political superstructure, had to be immediate with brief transitional mechanisms. The socio-economic changes can only take place progressively. We can use many measures to assess the advancement of people's quality of life. Let me just use uh, social demographics just for purposes of illustration. Africans are still overrepresented among the chronically poor. But the African middle class expanded from about 17% of the total in 1993 to 47% in 2008 and 64% in 2017. The elite in the highest income category are more homogeneously white, although the African proportion of this category had grown to about 22% by 2017. In tertiary education, like here in the University of Johannesburg, enrolled students have almost doubled since 1994. And whilst African students were less than half then, today they make up about 71% of the student population. Now, we can engage in detailed technical number crunching. That is important, but it does little to explicate the fundamental issues about the fate of a civilization. We can periodize and outline recent embarrassing weaknesses, such as declining state capacity, as well as state capture. While this may solve a conscience and allow us to let off steam, 
it does not clarify the more fundamental issues. What is required is an understanding of the philosophical underpinning to the transformation project as a civilizing mission. I'll outline just four strategic trends in this regard. The first one is on the quality of economic growth. South Africa's industrial development is still skewed to the highly developed minerals and energy complex with weak links to other industries domestically. Our exports have grown, but by less than 10% those of Botswana, Brazil, Malaysia, and Mexico. Besides this path dependency, we have got high levels of monopolization, resulting in high markups in the product market. At the same time, black entrepreneurial impulses were decimated under colonialism, and we remain with a low entrepreneurial activity index. From the point of view of productive forces, can South Africa's national democracy point to decisive interventions since 1994 that are both prominent and epoch-making? Of course, to answer this question, we would need to do a proper audit, and we'll find some successes. But we will also find a large graveyard where innovations go to die. And so there is a sense in which the new elites have, so to speak, inherited the master machine and are merely engaging in minor renovations. The second strategic trend is about inequality. Experience over the years has shown that economic growth and poverty reduction do not necessarily translate into a decrease in inequality. We raise this issue not merely from the perspective of a social morality, but social cohesion and the sustenance of economic growth depend on the reduction of inequality. This is shown by research by many writers who have shown that uh, there is correlation between inequality and poor macrosocial indicators. Some have shown that longer spells of growth are robustly associated with more equality. And so, this means that South Africa will not attain high rates of growth on a consistent basis unless it also deals decisively with social inequality. The third strategic trend relates to post-colonial capitalist class formation. Though many in the liberation movement are loath to acknowledge this, the fact of the matter is that both by implication and in actual practice, South Africa's transformers are managing a capitalist system. It follows, therefore, that construction of a national democracy also has to entail a conscious act of building a new capitalist class. And lest we forget, capitalist class formation was historically a brutal, heartless, and often violent process of competition and elimination. History is littered with wars, forced labor, slavery, and neocolonial machinations impelled by the search for profit and dominance. Over the years, there have been many attempts to introduce rules that promote some order and a level of protection 
from the rapacious license of this system. But this has not stopped illegal activities and operations in the gray area between illegality and lawlessness. This is of profound relevance to South Africa. Many post-colonial societies had to grapple with the emergence of a parasitic, state-dependent bureaucratic bourgeoisie and local comprador capitalists who rely on the established elite. But it can be argued that there is capitalism and capitalism. There's the Anglo-Saxon model, which is associated with neoliberalism. There are social democratic welfare states. There are unique features found in the German model. Southeast Asia and its developmental states have added new insights. But even in the more socially conscious violence of the system, there has been chronism, including, for instance, the Shire Balls in South Korea and German national champions who get a slap on the wrist when they misbehave. South African society has to exercise its mind on this phenomenon of post-colonial capitalist class formation. Of course, there will be run-of-the-mill entrepreneurs seeking to succeed from an honest day's work. Others will seek to operate in gray areas bordering on illegality, and yet others will engage in corrupt activities and even try their hand at systemic state capture. There will also be some in sectors such as the taxi industry who strive to avoid full-blown legality and at the extreme end, criminal raiders who stalk construction sites to extract ransom. We should have tried better to align our empowerment programs with industrial policy as happened in Southeast Asia. We should also have expected and planned for the negative tendencies, for what one can refer to as a lumpen bourgeoisie working with elements of the established capitalist class to attach themselves to corrupt individuals in politics, the trade union movement, and civil society. The abiding lesson from post-colonial countries is that if these negative tendencies are allowed to become dominant, the new and fragile polity can, un can very easily unravel into a cesspool of illicit accumulation and political disorder. The fourth strategic trend pertains to party political dynamics. As many historians have emphasized, political organization and leadership are critical to the sustenance of a civilization. How do South Africa's political permutations stack up in this regard? We have referred to the country's constitution. Let us briefly look at the party political domain. What is of concern currently is the rise of narrow identity politics, the tendency quite opportunistically and crudely to retreat to racial lagers as the primary form of political mobilization. While in the early post-1994 period, many of the large parties seemed to appreciate that success in sustaining social stability and change depended on consciously avoiding setting the social tinder on fire, this seems to have dissipated. To mix metaphors, 
the pressure cooker is being heated without any escape hatch for the rush of steam. Recent pronouncements by a leader of the Freedom Front Plus calling for an independent Western Cape constitutes an extreme manifestation of this. Faced with the challenge from its right, the Democratic Alliance seems bent on playing in that terrain to try and retain the bed in hand in terms of conservative white voters instead of pursuing two in the bush. This is reflected, for instance, in its recent resolution rejecting the use of racial categories as a means to identify and uplift the disadvantaged, as well as the dog whistle that farm murders are a hate crime. The leadership of the economic freedom fighters has historically crudely sought to exploit racial tension. But in recent times, it seems to be even at doing itself. The events at Brackenfell High School, for instance, reflect this tendency, added to which are threats against the police. At the same time, the African National Congress, through some of the resolutions from its recent national conference, seems to be trying to cover its left flank on radical economic transformation. On these and other issues, the political parties do face an existential question about capacity to lead society, even if sectoral interests may diverge. In addition, the ANC as a governing party faces a more critical challenge about whether it can renew itself and society and at the same time maintain unity within its ranks. This question also arises in the context of massive, open, and clandestine resistance to the renewal efforts by beneficiaries of corruption and state capture. To use biblical fables, two syndromes worsen the situation. The first one is the Samsonite suicidal mission to want to collapse the temple with all inside. And the second one is about the danger of mass exhaustion and impatience in the renewal track to the so-called promised land. People may get so tired that they start demanding a return to their place of enslavement. Further, through actions that on the surface appear militant, we may end up sabotaging the renewal project. And so given all this, shall South Africa's civilization of national democracy follow the ancient polities that collapsed. The economic reconstruction and recovery plan contains many major interventions. Our task is not just about correcting small weaknesses and introducing minor adjustments. It is fundamentally about the need to pick up a political economy battered by a once in a century event. The elements of the plan are widely known, and there are many issues that can be debated, including fiscal and monetary policy. But in terms of civilizational discourse and development of productive forces, there are many issues that require consideration. For instance, the hydrogen economy and fuel cell technology, manufacturing capacity for supplies to the infrastructure projects across Sub-Saharan Africa, more systemic application of the 
fourth industrial revolution and so on. I think there could also be better support for small or rather micro enterprises. Given that we registered many of them during high levels of uh, COVID-19 lockdowns. And these businesses are owned mostly by women with daring and initiative. What is most critical is that this plan forms an important part of the social compact that South Africa requires. But I think the circle of participants in compacting can be widened. For instance, it is not quite clear why the second largest federation is not part of these processes. It would seem by dint of some bureaucratic gatekeeping in Nedlec. Most importantly, what needs emphasis is the need for core lessons around essence. In other words, as we clamor for quick wins, we should not lose sight of the conceptual questions facing South African society by burying our heads in a welter of detail. Let us look at three elements of this essence. The first one is about the character of the social system. If it is indeed true that we are managing a capitalist system, then we need to agree on how we can re-engineer an economic structure inherited from colonialism. This should be a combination of a developmental state that leads all of society in pursuing consistently high rates of growth and social democracy underpinned by comprehensive redistributive measures. The second element of essence is about the core objective of socioeconomic policy. In my view, there should be a minimum standard of living below which no South African should sink. Elements of these are outlined in the National Development Plan, and there should be serious dialogue on how to attain that decent standard of living. The third element of essence is about the leadership role of the state. Besides leading in crafting a vision and mobilizing society, the state has to make difficult choices when agreement eludes the partners. Pursuit of absolute consensus can only result in the lowest common denominator and minimal progress. Let us cite for purposes of illustration, some crude examples of sacrifices that may be required. With regard to workers, given that the facilitators of state capture cleverly, carelessly, and in a populist fashion, extended benefits to employees within some state institutions, and I'm not saying this because Tepiso is here, uh, how does society deal with the conundrums in relation to public service pay and an unsustainable personnel budget at the SABC and other state inst institutions? For civil society and communities, should we expect the judiciary and security agencies to meet their mandate in the face of resistance if we do not help in disrupting the disruptors? Further, can communities expect uninterrupted services such as electricity if there is no commitment to pay when we have used more than the guaranteed pre free basic service. These are random examples to underline the point that leadership in the context of social compacting 
also means accepting sacrifices and having the courage to communicate difficult decisions to constituencies. In conclusion, let us come back to the question of the day. Can South Africa's civilization of national democracy sustain itself? In a roundabout way, the answer from this exposition is yes. But this is more a function of social agency, of citizen activism, and leadership acumen, and it cannot be a quake of fate. In this regard, the words of African leaders at the recent Tana Forum in Ethiopia come to mind. And this is that our aim should not be to build back better, but to build forward differently. In that way, we will be able to reach for Chief Albert Lutuli's ideal that, and I quote, somewhere ahead, there beckons a civilization which will take its place in God's history with other great human synthesis, Chinese, Egyptian, Jewish, European. It will not necessarily be all black, but it will be African, end of quote. As we all strive together to emerge from the devastation of COVID-19, we dare to remember that we are our own liberators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vonne uh, Chitenjo. Certainly a lot to unpack, to chew on. Professor Mtsebi Sinzletiana has uh, uh, been uh, listening in, and I'm sure there are a lot of things that are running rings around your head because there's so much to talk about. Uh, just a reminder to those who are participating in this webinar, please use the Q&A function of the Zoom app to pose your question. And if you want to be specific about to whom you're posing the question, please do so as well. Um, so the ball is in your court, Professor Antlegiana. If uh, there's anything that you either strongly disagree with or you'd like to question or let you change about, please do that. Um, your comment for now? Uh, well, let me, let me start off with a general, general comments, a few, uh, then we'll pick up the specifics perhaps later on. Well, firstly, congratulate Mistra on its 10th anniversary and quickly take credit for some of those years when I was there. <laughs> um, well, is, this, is, is South Africa's national democracy a civilization? Perhaps not. Perhaps not because being a civilization denotes a certain level of longevity and an entrenchment in society as part of, of, of public consciousness. It's an, ex, it's an accepted ethos and way of life that has endured over a, a longer period of time. Our national democracy, as Jewel said earlier, is, is, fairly, is, fairly, is relatively short. Uh, 25 years or so. Um, it is a project that has gained strength. Um, strength because of what preceded our democracy. It has a normative base, uh, a set of values that were built over uh, a long period of time. Uh, concept of social justice, acceptance of non-racialism, non um, so, so these are, these are and, and of course, institutional infrastructure, associational life, organizations. So these are, these, these are all uh, um, institutional network and normative base that we, we, we built over the years and formed the foundation of our democracy in 1994. However, soon after that, 
there emerge contestation over the exact vision that should arise out of that general vision or ethos we had built over the last years of anti-apartheid struggle. So, so there is that contestation, not only within those who led the anti-apartheid struggle, but within society generally. Um, I don't think a white society, uh, there is unanimity over the kind of, of vision, or even social justice. Um, there, there has been a shrinking away from confronting the unpleasantness of the past and what you need to do to overcome that unpleasantness. Instead, when those uncomfortable conversations are introduced, people feel accused. And unfortunately for our case in our society, you have these, uh, the stratification that Joel was talking about, the political elite is by and large black, and the, 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 the capital class is white. However, to build uh, this, this sustainable society, you need a fusion or you know, a coming together mm. of, of, of both classes. May I ask a question just in light of that? And, mm. and you may respond as well, Virgil. If you are talking about um, longevity and you're talking about it being entrenched, is it accidental or is it intended? Especially when uh, you yourself, you're talking about the contestation of ideals and ideas. So if we are talking about sustainability, is it intended or is it accidental? Uh, he was speaking about the fact that uh, South Africa's leadership now has to preside over the oppressed and the oppressors. Well, it, it, the process of building has got to be deliberate, intentional. Um, and, and by the way, there's no guarantee that it ought to succeed. There's no ought. It's not, it's not mechanical. Uh, it depends on what happens at certain points in time. And, and so it becomes a, a, an everyday exercise that people have to stick with. Mm -hmm. uh, it has got to be a, a vision that society pursues. Um, but you see, the, 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 the other challenge, Tepiso, is, is and, and this perhaps has nothing to do, it's not a critique of the political elite, but the reality of the day is that to what extent do you make way for long-term planning uh, whilst at the same time you are grappling with the realities of the day? So how do you make these choices? Because some of the choices that are essential for, for your sustainability and, and stability in the long term requires that you make sacrifices in the immediate. And so, um, uh, Having come into, into power in 1994, faced with all sorts of challenges, uh, and you need power, obviously, talking about politics. So in making the sacrifices at that moment for long-term gains, you risk uh, losing power in the immediate period. Mm. So, so it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a period of constant balancing. However, having said that, Coming back to one of the points that you were raised, I'm not sure if I'm answering no, your yes, question. Yes, you are indeed. <laughs> Coming to one of the points that you were raised is that um, we, we, we are too comfortable in our diversity and celebrating this thing that there must be consensus, there must be, and we must pull everybody behind us. But I think there is right and wrong. Um, these multiple visions are not all correct. <laughs> Some of them are just, are just facades. And, and, and so in, in, in trying to nurse this pseudo mm. at times culture of, 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 of um, bringing everybody together, uh, you know, diversity, this and that, we are in the process indulging absurdity. Mm. And, and uh, just to follow up on that, when mm. it you, you spoke about that, uh, mm. the concept of civilization, how society's uh, uh, humanity's sense of a social justice, but you mm. also spoke about the ambivalence when you're talking about the competing priorities within societies, for instance, those who would want to call for radical change. But from what uh, Professor Ntlejana is talking about, that 
are, are we a little too comfortable in accepting those differences? And I, I also take it back to that whole point that I was asking, that if we talk about sustainability and intentionality, how do we then reach the point? Yes, perhaps let me start off uh, with uh, the second question. To make the fundamental point that from its broad contours, from its philosophical basis, as well as from its aspiration, the South African constitution and the kind of social system we seek to build has got those elements of a civilization. But we would not have been here today if it was obvious that that civilization or potential civilization can sustain itself. And that sustenance, as we were saying, cannot be a quake of fate. It cannot be automatic. It depends on citizen activism. It depends on a leadership across all sectors who have got strategic acumen. Leadership of the business community that appreciates that just pursuit of unlimited profit without addressing challenges of poverty and inequality will not sustain, let alone the system, but even their own businesses. You need a political leadership that appreciates that we have varying views in society. There are certain constituencies that we represent, but there should be a higher order of things that we should seek to pursue. Mm. But can you be an active citizen if, as you mentioned, uh, you spoke about agency, but if you say we are a, a social exper experiment, a, a laboratory of humanism? Yes, I was saying we are a social laboratory precisely because I do not think there are many other countries that have got the same demographics and social relations, social and political relations that we have. Demographics, blacks are in the majority. At the political level, as Prof. Nkechana was saying, it's blacks who are in the majority. At the highest level of the economy, it's whites who are the majority. Elements, especially of the economy, have been inherited from the past. And so how do we introduce fundamental changes that help to transform all this? And the fundamental point that we're making today is citizen activism, and leadership with strategic mm. argument. That's well, what we need to sustain this, let's call it nascent civilization of national democracy. I'm going to allow you to finish your train of thought and go through the Q&A uh, questions because we've got quite a few. If you have a question, please use that uh, forum, the Q&A section of Zoom. So, Professor Ndekia? Well, the last point was uh, to, to we, we, these things are not, are not ordained to happen in a particular way. Perhaps to emphasize the point I was trying to make earlier, they, they are a product on, on, of, of constant effort. Um, again, to, to not perhaps impose, but cultivate sufficient consensus and entice others who are otherwise reluctant behind a common one vision that the country should pursue. And that, I mean, Joa said this earlier, that it will not be a, 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 a smooth process. It's going to be a confrontation. So we should accept conflict as a necessary, as a necessary mishap or event in the pursuit of this broader society that is just for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, just being relative, but there, I think there are certain fundamental points that society or we agree upon. So, so the, the, this idea of, of, of taking everything on board, that everybody has a view, there are people who just have incorrect views. I mean, you know, it's, that's obvious. 
and, and, and then we should try more. I don't want to say impose, but I think we do need to have a confrontation in this country about the kind of visions that we have and, and you know, have one vision prevail and then bring society behind uh, that one vision. This idea of multiple visions that everything goes, it's, it, just, it just doesn't work. It, it, it creates a sense of paralysis. Mm. Yeah. I mean, when you spoke about the constitution, I mean, that's something we'll talk about later on because then it does throw up those questions about if we're respecting the rights of the majority, of the minority, etc. So let me just go to a few questions here. I'm, I'm not sure who they're directed to, some of them, but uh, you are both more than <coughs> welcome to respond. So Mdu Mkonza says, your fourth strategic focus area seems to assume the political system pre-COVID-19 will remain. This is not in accordance with the discussion and prediction of the effects of the new normal, where digital platforms are the norm and surveillance capitalism is a new struggle for equity the surveillance capitalists are the new kings and queens. I, I think this is directed at you, Vo Nechitenze, um, Doom Konza saying this, and we'll go on to the next question, um, select in Patele later on. So let's first answer that because it seems like a rather involved question. Yes, I, I, I would agree with that observation. You cannot go through the kind of experience that we have had of COVID-19 and emerge from the other side, living the type of life that you lived before, continuing with operations, whether be in universities, in research institutes, in companies, both public and private, as well as in politics, as if COVID-19 didn't happen. As I was saying during the presentation, um, there are two directions in which civilizations can move when faced with a crisis or a disaster. The one might be total collapse. We do not quite know what then happened to Mapungubwe when it collapsed. Did they migrate north to Zimbabwe? We do not quite know. We can talk about Sofala, Kilwa, and, 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 and others. So there is that possibility. But after pestilence, as I was saying, you can also move to a higher level of both political and social organization. Many historians argue that uh, the European Renaissance was in part a follow on, if not a direct consequence of the bubonic plague or black death. So after COVID-19, there are many things that will change, how we use technology and so on. But uh, we should also not exaggerate that possibility. Uh, shall, I'm just giving a crude example now. Shall we continue with uh, many companies having stuff that works from home if these vaccines actually succeed and are made accessible to the majority of the global population. There might be change, but it might not be massively qualitative. Let me just conclude by emphasizing something else that I might not have emphasized during the presentation. When you have something like COVID-19, they are losers, and these are the majority of humanity, and they are winners. The winners include ICT companies. It includes companies that are developing the vaccines. It includes companies that will manufacture the vials and the fridges and the syringes. What should humanity do about that? Or what should those companies themselves do to contribute to humanity? Should there be consideration of a windfall tax or should they themselves voluntarily contribute to humanity given the profits that they are going to make out of this mishap? Because tax. you did mention earlier on an inherent ability to regenerate and I was actually wondering, especially in light of that, 
what factors then are, uh, is it common cause how uh, to determine what to keep and uh, not to stick with looking at uh, Africa during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic? I mean, it has, there's been a lot of surprise as to how well it's handled the pandemic or how it has not been uh, as badly hit as other provinces, especially, I mean, um, parts of the world, especially the Northern Hemisphere. So uh, is it resilience? Is it uh, the ability to uh, regenerate, given the fact that we've been through uh, various pandemics, for instance? I mean, those are the things that I'm, I'm wondering when you talk about that. I think in my view, let's just broaden it. In my view, Homo sapiens emerged and has evolved to some extent, but now uh, survived on this planet in part as a consequence of its ingenuity to use natural resources and adapt them to its benefit. It has done so also because it evolved forms of social organization that would introduce some order. It has also done so because over the millennia, science has evolved and given capacity to Homo sapiens to be able to adapt and survive and even make easier. The, 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 the lives that we lead. But we were also making the point, social systems and levels of stratification can so develop that they result in the collapse of that particular social system or that particular civilization. And given the experiences we have today, the levels of inequality across the globe, the falling uh, levels of uh, legitimacy of the political economies and the polities, if you look at what is happening in the US, for instance, given tendencies to want to go to war and all kinds of geopolitical tensions, in my view, Homo sapiens or humanity today has to ask itself the question, are we not doing things that might lead to the collapse of this civilization on a global scale? All right, Select Mpashele, your question saying or comment saying imperialism, which is the highest uh, stage of capitalism, will continue to flourish in different forms as long as uh, conditions permit it. It is a known fact that the Kempton Park negotiation failed to destroy the imperialistic economic domination by adopting a constitution that protected white property rights. There will be no genuine economic transformation unless if the ownership of land can be addressed. And uh, I'll get you to comment on that, Professor Ndlejana, but Khabo Masehela saying, question to Vonech Tenje, what do you view as the main challenges for researchers and the research community in the context of COVID when a data trend analysis had been interrupted and therefore failed societies and institutions and planning a very interesting one. I'll remind you of it if you want me to, but let me start with you, uh, Professor Ndlejana, on that um, point by a select Mpahlele suggesting that the Kempton Park negotiation has failed to destroy the imperial imperialistic economic domination, especially referring to white property land rights. Well, I think, I think generally now the rest of the world, uh, most part of the world recognizes that um, you need some degree of state regulation uh, that uh, capitalism on its own, left to its own devices, uh, does not lead to broader societal development. Uh, there's a strong selfishness involved there. Uh, well, the, 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 the fact that I don't think it was ever the intention of ANC negotiators to destroy capitalism <laughs> when they were negotiating in 1994. Uh, they've always been speaking of a mixed economy. Um, and as I said just now, that 
private capital is accepted as part of global economy. Anyone who wishes capitalism away is speaking voodoo economics, really. Uh, but the question is, is, is to what extent do you regulate that and show that it doesn't, it doesn't you know, work, work exploitatively to the detriment, by and large, of, of the rest of society. Uh, so it's not, it's not really a critique as such, but reminds us of the necessity um, to, 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 for the state to play this important role. And the state has historically, I mean, capitalism pretty much grew because of state protection. Um, so this idea that you can't have the state intervening in the economy is, is ahistorical. Um, but in our case, I think there has been a certain level of timidity, I guess, to some degree, in as much as uh, certain concessions had to be made a lot earlier, protecting private property, this and that. Um, but there were certain redistributive projects that had to be undertaken to aid the consolidation of our new democratic state. And of course, the land issue is the one issue that we always talk about, um, that, that not serious measures were taken there to, to, to ensure that you have a certain degree of redistribution. Um, that said, obviously, I'm fully aware that some of these things need not be done to satisfy slogans, but you also have to have substantive measures to, to help with farming on the land and all those things. But fundamentally for me, I think the issue has, has always been to, to to nurture this transition and show it is delicate. So, so you nurture it, you manage it, uh, but we haven't veered sufficiently enough towards the side of really transforming society and, and even facing the possibility that there might be a little bit of backlash. Uh, but we need to accept that you cannot change society without a little bit of discomfort. Okay. So when I should change this question is from Khawuma Seha, basically about uh, your view on the main challenges for researchers and the research community in the context of uh, COVID-19, uh, saying that data trend analysis has been interrupted and therefore failed societies and institutions and planning emotionally and strategically, is it not a better articulation to focus on commitment to social democracy rather than mobilizing around a concept of better capitalism, given our history? And Tsekiso Machike is uh, uh, saying, in your strategic uh, threads, you posit that our economy is skewed with high levels of uh, monopolization. However, I'm interested to learn about the demographic profile of the monopolization you speak about in terms of race and gender. So those are two questions for you there. Okay, I'll start with the last one, just to indicate that one does not have uh, the data immediately available. But uh, as I was saying during the presentation, I think if we were to use uh, the JSE as a proxy, um, we will establish that it's only some three to nine percent that is owned by black people, especially the, the large companies. But if you include institutional invest investors, that goes higher, uh, beyond 10 percent, maybe even approaching the 20s, if not beyond. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, in addition to the South African social demographic, um, the JSE is also now also owned by international institutional capital as well as individual investors. So the diversity of ownership has changed massively. Having said all that, what we cannot run away from, which is a continuing challenge, is that blacks still own in so far as the general economy is concerned, far much less than their proportion of the population. That is what needs to be corrected in the medium to, 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 to long term. Now, coming to the question about data and trend analysis, there, there will be a disruption, but I suppose um, 
statisticians know how to deal with these kinds of challenges. We have seen how Statistics South Africa has ad adapted its methodologies to current realities. And I think going forward in the medium term, people will be able to do linkages amongst different indicators as pre, during, and post-COVID. And would then be able to, to, to demonstrate the extent to which COVID might have had an impact on all kinds of things, including employment and investment and mental health and the combination of many, many other factors. I think future researchers will, will have lots of work to do for us to understand this. Um, then the, I think I should just underline what uh, Professor Angelchana was saying about uh, the reality that we are operating within a capitalist system. In my view, as I was trying to underline in the presentation, sometimes a denial of that reality that we are living under, operating and managing a capitalist system undermines the capacity especially of those in the erstwhile liberation movement to then pose the next fundamental question, what kind of capitalism should we have in South Africa? And in that regard, as I was saying, you can have the neoliberal type of the Anglo-Saxon model, you can have social democracy. It's still a capitalist system, but social democracy with comprehensive measures of redistribution. You can have the German model, which combines social democracy with representation of workers at the level of boards, technical training of a special type, and so on. You could also have the Southeast Asian type, the developmental states with higher rates of growth, consistently. In my view, South Africa should combine social democracy and developmental states. But ultimately nail their colors to the mast. Nail, you have to, you have to if you have to modify and transform the system. Okay. So we have Jose Mabaso here saying, thank you, Prof. What is the risk radar of the unemployment rate in the next decade? And how does the change how does that change the social, econo social um, economy and the focuses by government and private sector? Olisi Nochulana is saying, with the re-emergence of tribalism and neo-racism, how do we achieve the national democratic, democratic society? In exchange, I'm going to give that one to you. Tabang Tladi saying, is the ideology of conscious capitalism sustainable so you can both answer that question trying to get through as many questions as we can as we are running out of time and i hope colleagues you realize that we are uh, making the best effort with the, what little time we have if you can keep your questions short it might help so i can go through as many and i won't ask the same person's question twice so if you've written it a number of times please be mindful of that that we have to give everybody an opportunity and, professor and, and as you allocate the questions if you can just remind I'll us because repeat. it's not easy to, yes, to, to, to write repeat. down a speedy yes, yeah. definitely repeat them uh, uh professor Andrejana? well is it you're conscious still, capitalism you're, you're, you're still young i had thought <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so... Um, no, I got them. Yes. Capitalism with conscience, I suppose. That's oh, yes, like yes. Things. Capitalism with conscience. I mean, I think, I think uh, social democratic societies are somewhat based on that. Um, the acceptance uh, that you will have to pay more uh, tax and you have to respect the environment, uh, your productive methods should be sensitive, accept uh, different forms of energy and... So, so that's uh, kind of economic activity that doesn't, is not just limited to immediate profits, but mm. looks at the broader societal benefits. Uh, by and large, I think German and Scandinavian countries embrace a little bit of that. So it is, it is possible. Uh, and, and it's something that uh, we've been talking about in this country in the last few 
Um, I know Joel is very big on social compacting. I'm surprised he hasn't mentioned it yet. So maybe he'll come to that. Whether or not it is ultimately accepted, it's something else altogether, but it is possible. Unemployment, obviously, on the second question, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a ticking bomb, uh, especially because it affects mainly young people. People who don't have a stake in, in society are vulnerable to all sorts of uh, fanciful ideas like demagoguery that, that uh, promises um, immediate relief. Right, so, so the sooner we, we create employment, and of course this uh, clashes somewhat uh, this whole idea of moving as quick as possible to 4IR and technology, because most of these folks that are unemployed don't have papers, they're unskilled. Uh, so the question is, how then, if you have to absorb them into the labor market, expect that they should have skills when they don't have the papers. So which means you might have to sacrifice, have uh, you know, uh, um, labor intensive production instead of uh, tech, high tech stuff, because you are trying to absorb, to make a dent in the unemployed. So, and then that's, that's, that's the tricky part. I mean, that's the tricky part. And this is where perhaps the example of China becomes somewhat important here that we, we perhaps we shouldn't uh, uh, be fascinated with being fashionable. Uh, we should we should address the practicalities that we have as a society. With uh, oh, what is it now? Almost thirty percent or so unemployment, I guess. Um, so 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 how do you deal with that? Uh, and for me, I think China, without obviously following the t dictatorial tendencies of the Chinese, but try to to deal with it in the way that we are able to. Okay. <clears throat> This one is from Olisi in Ochulana. So uh, they wanted to know about the re-emergence of tribalism and uh, neo-racism. Neo How do we achieve national democratic society within this context? And uh, Tabang Tladi is the one that asked about uh, the ideology of a conscious capitalism. Is it sustainable? Okay. Yeah, maybe just starting off with uh, the last question to add to what uh, Professor Angelchana was, was saying. Social democracy has got many elements of this, but beyond that, perhaps what requires emphasis in the South African context, as we aim towards that kind of system, is that, as the professor was saying, you are able to tax and tax heavily in these welfare states, in social democracies. Why? Because the state enjoys legitimacy in the eyes of society. But secondly, the state has got the capacity to provide the services required by society, be it transport or health or education. So people will happily accept very high taxes because they know this will come back in the services that they enjoy. That's why you will find that in most of these countries, public transport is the most popular because it's efficient and it's part of the basic services provided by the state. Now, with regard to the reference to the challenge about re-emergence of a, let's call it ethnic chauvinism and to some extent uh, racism. Maybe the question that we need to pose is whether they are re-emerging or they are merely finding louder assertion in the discourse in society in that both consciously and maybe subliminally some of these elements might have existed in people's minds but they didn't have the courage to use them primarily as a basis for political mobilization i think that's the question that we need to ask our we need to ask ourselves and i would add further that especially with regard to ethnicity, there is a very 
difficult challenge that we have to address. It's a maybe a loose tightrope that we have to traverse. We have said, as a consequence of liberation, we need to ensure that the African people assert their culture, their culture or cultures, their languages, their ways of doing things, in terms of clothing and so on and so forth. But the formerly oppressed, and in particular the African people, don't speak the same language. The traditions and the cultures may not be the same. And so as we were quite correctly trying to encourage something that is indigenous to the country, we might at the same time have introduced an element of divergence. Mm. Because everyone then says, my own ethnic and language group, this is how we do things. And so it's fundamental that as we try to reassert and assert our, indigenous, our indigenity, we should do it in a way that doesn't create or recreate eth ethnic consciousness and encourages uh, ethnic church of anything. And with regard to race, I think as long as we have not dealt with the fundamental questions that have given rise to racism, the structural questions about social inequality, income, assets, opportunity, social capital, and so on, you will still find many in our society who believe that the privileges that they enjoy, which are to a large extent or to a significant extent inherited, are because they are different and they are superior, which in fact is not the case. Right, so we have quite a few questions to go through and I, and I do mention them uh, in numbers of two and three so that those who are watching and waiting for their answers um, are, don't become impatient and think I'm not coming to them. So I'll ask the first two or three and then we'll come to both of you to answer. Yaqub Abba Omar says, we have this vague notion of Western civilization, but which seems to permeate all aspects of the world. We can try to get rid of the worldview by asserting ourselves as Africans, Chinese, etc. But this still seems to be uh, by a uh, fulcrum around which the rest of the humanity revolves. If Mr. Nechutenu could give us a balance sheet of uh, forces, would he think that the tide is turning on this Western civilization? Perhaps let me get you to answer that first because it is a bit questioning. Dr. Mike Masia Bata will come back to your question. Okay. It's a, an involved question mm. and I'll try to be as brief as possible. I did indicate that uh, during the presentation that uh, for many centuries, China was the biggest economy on the globe. Uh, it's only from around the 16th or so to the 19th century that it experienced invasions and humiliations and so on. Uh, but what is good about China is having looked at its history and its capacity, it was able to pose to itself and answer the question, how do we modernize ourselves and rise, not so much as a civilization, but as a nation state, to occupy a position that one could say is equivalent to the size of population that they have. And having said this, will bring us to the question that has been posed. Uh, and this is that how various civilizations evolved historically 
created channels and paths of self-sustenance and further development, but somehow many dissipated. The European industrial revolutions were able to emerge and sustain themselves, and of course also used the canon and the whip and colonization and so on to further extend their power. If you were to ask me, I would say the conceptual approach that has been adopted by the Southeast Asian developmental states is firstly to acknowledge that historical humiliation and become quite angry about it, but not allow it to determine everything you do. Secondly, to acknowledge that as a consequence of the weaknesses that might have derived from things that we did wrongly, we then lagged behind in so far as development, economic development is concerned. So what is it that we can learn from the best in the world and use it for our own advancement? They did not stand on rooftops to say we are rejecting everything that is Western. They looked at the level of development of technology in the West and they said, what is it that we can get from that, adapt, that, adapt it to our situation and use it for our own development? This is what China has done very, very well. And so this brings us back to the attempt at the beginning of my presentation that we should not be so much like Huntington, be talking about Islam or Chinese or any other people or culture across the world as a civilization because arising out of that is that humanity is then divided into civilizations, which I think would be wrong. Huntington concludes by saying the clash going forward will be a clash of civilizations, and in my view, this is in part what informed some of the wars that have happened since 1993 in the Middle East and elsewhere. We are a common humanity, and I think states that develop, nations that develop well, acknowledge their weaknesses, that they might be backward in certain areas, and then pose to themselves the question, what can we adopt from humanity that might take us forward? Thank you very much for that, Wonich Tenje. Dr. Mike Masiapata, Prof, I'm going to give this question to you. How do we address the threat of populism on our democratic dispensation and restore the principle of ethical leadership? Um, well, populism uh, feeds off inequality uh, by and large. Yes, poverty is part of it, but inequality in the sense that uh, it makes people bitter. Uh, there's an embittering uh, effect about inequality, especially in a society where we're supposedly equal. And that has been the identity of our post-apartheid society, that it's a caring society, uh, equal opportunity to everybody, and yet at the same time you're seeing these inequalities widening, especially including within the black society. So, so the obvious answer to people is that you, you create opportunity. You, you bring people into the labor market. Uh, you deal with unemployment um, because you will, not, you will not, it's very difficult for, for folks who are unemployed, who are you know, going through hellish periods, to be excited about life. Um, they, they are looking for solutions and mm -hmm. if someone comes, and offers all sorts of solutions, they, they, they are most likely will respond to that. And, and, and some of these so-called solutions are not well thought out. They're just, you know, pie in the sky kind of solutions. So uh, giving them a stake, drawing them into the system, making sure that uh, they believe that the system cares for them, that they should not believe anything that promises the destruction of the system. Uh, if you have that, then, then you are fine. But if they feel that they've been spat out, they, they, they are not cared for, then they will join a fight towards destroying that system. Mm. 
It's so unfortunate <coughs> that we've run out of time, but I do want to read one or two uh, comments from the Q&A section so uh, to uh, ensure that colleagues don't feel that we're ignoring uh, them and their contribution as we do so in closing because my time is up and I've got to keep my mm. eye on the clock. Sipo Mandula saying the notion of political... Uh, party political narrow view of civilization and democracy is the fact that in a number of African countries, the national liberation movement had evolved into a party that legally or effectively monopolized power, often under the banner of uh, preserving independence from foreign interference. And Pat Naidu saying African leaders uh, recall that when the elephants fight, the grass gets uh, damaged, the nationalist elephants are fighting and strengthening democracy but simultaneously applying severe uh, breaking energy to the triple challenge of unemployment, inequality and jobs. How would you balance the pace of strengthening democracy with social deliverables of jobs, uh, service delivery and economic opportunities? And Pat and I do uh, from here uh, to UJ. I thought that's why we should at least pay homage <laughs> to our co-hosts. So um, let me start with you, Professor and Lejana, and you can also give us your closing comments and then we'll come to you, Vonich Denjit, for uh, you to close and, and perhaps keep those uh, thoughts in mind if you want to respond to that as well. I think, I think we have enough. Um, I believe that we have to close in 60 seconds, so if you could do that in 20, that would be great. We have enough uh, sub substantial normative base in terms of value system to enable us to, to reach the kind of vision that we want to reach. Um, there will be challenges, but there, we have a core identity, and I think that core identity will carry us through. All That's right. All. Well, <laughs> let's return to your final words. My Very final briefly. words would be to say as we choose uh, various paths of development, and the uh, systems of social organization. We should appreciate, in my view, that they should combine two elements. One is consistent and profound democracy. So when we say social democracy, we include the element of democracy, but also developmentalism, like a developmental state. If we were able to do that as South Africa, I think we would go very, very far and achieve the objectives contained in the National Development Plan and beyond. Thank you very much to you both, especially to you, Wonech Tenja, for a very uh, inspiring lecture. Remember, the discussion was whether can South Africa's civilization or national democracy sustain itself. I think uh, there's been uh, lots of things that have uh, been put on the table and lots of questions that remain unanswered that we hopefully will get you to respond to at some point. Uh, Geraldine Fraser Muratgeti was due to join us as the chairperson of the Council of Advisors for MISTRA, but is unfortunately unable to do so at the moment. So on behalf of her and uh, the University of Johannesburg, we'd like to thank you both. And uh, this is how we come to the end of MISTRA's uh, eighth lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think if you can just